Welcome to Level with Emily Reese. This episode features a conversation with legacy composer George Sanger. We talk about so many things. Uh, Firstly, we talk about his work on 1990s Wing Commander, which up until that point, nothing had sounded like that in video games. It was uh, incredibly... Uh, just ama- everything about the game. It was such a hugely popular game. And again, the music, just nothing sounded like it. Uh, so we talk about Wing Commander. We talk about The Seventh Guest, which is uh, from 1993. And that game is described as like an interactive movie adventure puzzler game. So, I mean, literally the first of its kind in that genre, I guess. I mean, really groundbreaking stuff that George uh, worked on in the early 90s. And he's continued as an artist this whole time. He writes uh, music all the time for varying things, Um, sometimes with friends, sometimes for games. uh, Sometimes he's a lyricist. He wrote lyrics for um, a song that's in Ark Nights. The song was written by Adam Gubman, and then uh, George Sanger did the lyrics, and George talks about that toward the end of the interview. He doesn't name the game. That's the only reason I bring it up. Uh, but we also talk about, like, the Beatles and how much energy George and his friend Ron received while they listened to the Beatles as youngsters and just the impact that that had on him as a musician and an artist and a person, really. Um, so that was really fun. And, uh, yeah, it was a long conversation. It was a Friday night. It was hot. Uh, But I just didn't want it to end. I seriously was drenched when I stood up, and I just didn't even want it to end. It was so much fun to speak with him and hear his stories and all of the wonderful things. Now, if you want to hear his music, you need to go to the audio version of the podcast. We do not put music samples in this version uh, for copyright reasons. Um, So make sure you uh, head over to wherever you get your podcasts, hopefully. Uh, We'll be there and uh, just download the audio version. Do subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please join us on Discord. You're invited. You're welcome. It's free. Um, Come hang out. Talk about games and music and games. Cats, dogs, chinchillas, all kinds of fun things. Uh, Link down there in the show notes. Subscribe to the YouTube. Become a patron if you're able. And that's enough from me. Now let's get on to this conversation with the wonderful composer George Sanger. Oh, one other thing, two other things really I need to mention. George's nickname is the Fat Man. We don't talk about that. There are a lot of places you can find the etymology of that choice. It has to do with a typo on a business card, I think, or something like that. Um, But he also is in a band called Team Fat. And also in that band with him is Dave Govett. And Dave Govett is also a composer, and Dave Govett and George Sanger co-composed the music for Wing Commander back in 1990. So that comes up a few times just so you're prepared for that. I think that's it. I'm out of the way now. On to this wonderful conversation with uh, Mr. George Sanger. Despite me wearing this retro shirt, I was not a gamer when I was younger. My mother wouldn't allow it. So I didn't have, even though I was born in 76 and grew up in the right time, quote unquote, I really didn't have a lot of those experiences that other people did. And so I came to your music as an adult who had had, you know, a few degrees training in classical music and jazz and all of this different background, I think, than um, some people, for better or worse, but um, only meaning that it was... It, it, it's so fun to hear, in in particular, Wing Commander, and, and I promise I'll stop talking soon, but uh, with Wing Commander, I, I felt like, you know, I'd never heard anything like that before, which is one of the accolades that it gets. It's unique for very many reasons that I'll, I would like you to kind of expand upon, but, um, but also because it just totally sounds like you're a classical music nerd, but I didn't really get any of that from your biography really. So, so I just, I just loved that about it anyway. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is there a question in there? Um, no, I yeah. don't know. I don't know. I think it's just yeah. a comment really. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, 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 there's an interesting connection between, I mean, I'm so glad you're coming at it. Not, not from the game. <laughs> angle because uh, there's a there's a tangle between what we do as as game musicians and what we do as musicians, 
um, there's kind of that feeling that all oh, the ones that I get the accolades for are it's only because they played that game and only because, you know, uh, they sat in their dad's lap and he helped them move the mouse. And, you know, they have these great associations. The first time that I ever heard music that had any instruments in it, you know, that mm. weren't, you know, so, so for a lot yeah. of people, that's all mixed in. And I think it's great. Um, but uh, it's nice to have somebody listen to it outside of that context and say, well, what is this? Yeah. You know, independent of 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 how how you grew up, um, so it's very nice of you to say those things. I think that what you're hearing for the classical nerd, though, I think what you're hearing is Dave Govett, who's who's oh, uh, interesting. He, okay, yes, yes, I, I I think that that his flavor is in there. Although I've been trying lately, uh, uh, I've kind of felt my way through the classical nerd zone. I here's here, here's here's Matt's. Here's me. <laughs> you, know, you know, John. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. John, although, no, there's a Venn diagram of where we, uh, you know, geek <laughs> out with the instruments. Like, I can kind of toot a, toot a weird horn. Um, <laughs> but, but I, I, I think of, you know, there, there's some of these guys are really legit. Um, Clint Bajakian, um, you know, who was, who was very upset when Seiji Ozawa was ill. You know, he almost couldn't. <laughs> It's like, how am I going to get through lunch? Seiji Ozawa is not feeling well. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I took classical music training at Occidental College. Okay. But I, did, I was not top of the class. I was the guy in the band that wore the gold lame and did the Elton John tunes. <laughs> and I just and I wanted to be dedicated to that band, so I switched my major from physics engineering over to music. No. Um, now Govett, he just kind of showed up out of nowhere one day. He wanted to see my studio setup. This was before I had Team Fat or anything. I'd just done a couple of games. Okay. And uh he wanted to see how I did it. So he came over to check out my rig, but when he got into the neighborhood, he phoned me up and he went to a pay phone and uh, phoned me up and asked if I could pick him up from the bus stop. Um, so I did. And I guess he was working a uh, bartender or, or waiting tables at a, at a, you know, in my neighborhood. Um, and, but uh, he was kind of a composer. So he, I, I, I had him do a couple of tunes, but when, uh, and he was good. I think for, for Maniac Mansion, he did a couple of things. Um, but when Chris Roberts asked me to do Wing Commander, he wanted something that was like, uh, you know, somewhere between Star Wars and, and the Star Trek movie. You mm -hmm. know, very, very John Williams. And I was kind of busy. And I thought, well, hey, Govett, can you do something like this? And he goes, well, I've got a couple of tunes that have been bouncing around in my head since high school. So, you know, maybe I can do it. And very West Texas, very, very, uh, um, a very interesting guy, great guy, yeah. um, but unassuming. You know, well, I got a couple of things. Uh, you know, I, I've got them in my head. I'll just put them into the computer, and and you know, and we'll see. And that was the the main thing. The 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 two main pieces. The dog fight was just there in his head. The yeah. fanfare was there in his head, and he put them down. Now, everywhere where you hear those tunes again in a variation, yeah, like like the the parody of the. Uh, you know, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, the parody of game music, yep. and uh, and a lot of the dog fi uh, flying out to the to the mission, flying back, those things. That's that's me doing variations and trying trying my chops at doing the the classical feel. So yeah. Dave, he just loved that classical. He loved the uh, John Williams stuff, and he used to say stuff like, "Well, you know, I tried doing some uh, I tried doing some Stravinsky. You know, I tried to make something that sounds like Stravinsky. He says it was not that hard." He said, but John Williams, man. So <laughs> I don't know how I, to feel about that. <laughs> I, no, it, you, right? you get that a lot with him. <laughs> get that a lot with him. He's like, uh, <laughs> his brilliance is, is up here. His, his heart is with the people. <laughs> you know, he, he, when, when they do that focus group stuff, you know, it's 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 for him. So he's got this, this superpower. Uh, we, yeah. we went to Las Vegas and and. Uh, 
you know, part of the reason we were in Las Vegas, uh, maybe not on that trip, maybe a different trip, uh, because Hans Zimmer, uh, no, no, it was a different thing. Hans Zimmer had him come out and explain some technical things, uh, but it was the mm. O show. Cirque du Soleil had, had Govett come out and, and Kevin, another guy on our team, to help them work their Giga studio. It was like one of the first oh. sampling uh, rigs. We could get into that, but, uh, but we were out there. And uh, Govett was saying, man, the Cirque du Soleil, he said, that's, that's the best of humanity. <laughs> really? Yeah. And all this art that's out amazing. here in Las Vegas, that's the best of humanity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really, it's, it's a not, I, I, I called you legit. It's a not <laughs> illegitimate uh, approach to life. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. 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 Exactly. He's a, uh, he's a cop now. Oh, no he said kidding. that the, the pressure of doing game audio was not as stressful as potentially facing an armed perpetrator. So there's there's something for you. There's something for your for your interview. <laughs> Why thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can and, and keep wow. that in the back of your mind when you're talking to all these these poor <laughs> game audio. <laughs> That that it was more stressful to work in game audio than it is. It was to be more a stressful to work in game audio. Yeah, he just couldn't face another call from another client. Oh um, man. Yeah, and he was working for Doug Rogers too. He was he was building sample libraries too. Okay. And uh, and that was also stressful. So you know he just and he was a marine before that. Okay. Um and and he he liked the well, he didn't didn't like the fighting and the violence and that part of it but he liked being in a, a peacekeeping role and he liked the camaraderie and mm -hmm. uh and whenever we would play a first person shooter game uh which was we only played outlaws which is a very <laughs> primitive one we played it because our friends worked on the music you know yeah, sure <laughs> of course <laughs> and uh he would he would just he was just so amazing at that he he'd always choose the rifle and get up in the uh get up on the edge of the canyon and pick us off and we never knew what hit us <laughs> <laughs> now when, this probably isn't the time to talk about stuff like that oh i know but it, i'm curious so i'm going to keep asking you about him just briefly even though this isn't about him but um was he in the marine band was did he play music at all when he was in in the marines Do not in the marines but okay. uh in the but in at yeah. ut he was a prize-winning timpani player oh god so you'll hear a lot of, it was like blue ribbon. You can't doom, make that doom, shit doom, up. Doom. Yeah. No, you can't. <laughs> and, and, and when, uh, when, when, you know, he would pick up these hobbies and always be amazing at them. Whatever he tried, he was always amazing at it. And he took up uh, bagpipe drumming. And you know what that is. I mean, when you, when, you know, the, the guy's yeah. playing the bagpipes. And, yeah. And there's no space in between the notes. You know, it's just like fly shit. Yeah. <laughs> and he would he could play that just wow just he just he's an amazing guy he's still around <laughs> and joe mcdermott the one the one I, the one guy left on team fat that i you know the composers that i didn't yeah. mention before he's teaching at uh at city college in uh, at austin city college and govett is campus cop there so they oh, wow. run into each other all the time and Govett will come by and he's like, well, hey, listen to this thing I just recorded. Here's some speakers I built. You know, he built some ultra high fidelity audiophile speakers from scratch. And oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't even know <laughs> the first guys. way to start that project other than to get a cabinet. That would be step one. And that would be yeah. the only step I would know, like build a box. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Incredible. So that's my, I mean, so, so that's, I guess, kind of a soft way of getting into Team Fat. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Which, which I, was just, it was just my, it was the, the dream, you know, it was like, uh, I was raised on the monkeys and the Beatles, mm -hmm. you know, hard, and specifically like Hard Day's Night, Help, you know, the, the, the fictitious oh, yeah. Beatles. Yeah. And, and you want that, you want that house by the beach where, you know, it's like a tree house, like a tree fort, and mom's not coming home anytime soon, and musical accidents can happen, and, and it's it's freedom and hippies, and, mm -hmm. and and we had that, and, and we had the support 
uh, of a couple of remarkable women as well, yeah. um, which was weird for the game industry. So yes, uh, yeah. So my my wife sort of ran the um, the company and the and the you know the legal things and the mm-hmm. the monetary things and and the you know all the all the admin mm-hmm. and and Teresa Avalon who we called Spanky uh she she was marketing and promotion and stuff and then and also those two and me uh put on a brainstorming um conference that lasted uh, about 25 years two of them one for audio and one for game design so ah. Uh, so, so it was, uh, even though it was one of those cases where the, the boys are doing the, you know, it's, it's the boys in the band and the girls are doing the other stuff. Yeah. Uh, nonetheless, it was, it was, I'm, I'm mostly not proud of my diversity record. Uh, but that was one <laughs> case in which, uh, people would say, wow, you know, you brought women to the game developer conference. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's much different now, which is yes, good. Thank God. Yeah, that's that's for sure. There's something about the game industry as far as uh, as far as the early days anyway. Um, it, it it around the you know, when the first person shooters came in, it, it got to be kind of a bro bro rockercy. Um, <laughs> yeah. But before that zone, which uh, which I, I kind of feel like was was my you know, when we were first coming up, mm-hmm. um, it, it it wasn't, we were nerds. It was like game night, uh, you know, like, like family game nights are now. Um, we would have, the, the, the boys would have accepted the girls, it would have been so happy, yeah. you know, and, and were whenever someone came along. And there were, there were women uh, there were uh, trans people, uh, beautiful people in mm-hmm. in the in the group, and it was very welcoming. So sometimes the fact that it was largely male is misinterpreted. Um, yeah, it it had sort of more the feel of like when well, you go to the Ren Fair, and and uh, mm-hmm. uh, it may be it may be most you know for, for a while it might have been mostly boys, but the women were so welcomed and adored. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, definitely. definitely. It was that kind of feel. I don't really know how to put it into words, and I don't want to over justify things that we did that were wrong. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. One of the other things I'm very curious about is IASIG. I would love to talk about that oh. too, because I think if that's okay, yeah. um, only because I know that you started it or were one of the first. And gang too, of course. Um, but for whatever reason, I think IA SIG needs a, like people need to know more about IA SIG, you know, um, uh. and the resources and the just all the wonderful things that it provides. So, do you mind kind of chatting about that for a little? I bit? think I can more talk about. Uh, the history of it than than the current state of things. I think that that's sure. a yeah um but uh we used to have let me and and let me also preface this by saying emily that i don't remember exactly how things happened and even if i did remember (laughs) it i wouldn't be right because i'm only one person and i saw everything from behind these eyes yeah um and there and yeah and also i had a tendency to think that things were revolving around me (laughs) <laughs> Which was tricky because sometimes they were. Sure. So how do you how do you extricate yourself? You know, from yeah. that you say, okay, now this time it wasn't you. Yeah. <laughs> that time maybe was it? I don't know. <laughs> so as I recall, there was an uh, you know when I first went to Game Developer Conference, I was the only audio person there. Mm. So that's wow. really something. That's amazing. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, and uh, I... Uh, now, what year was that? Not Sorry to interrupt, but... Oh, I would have a little trouble uh, putting my finger on it, but it, it would have been when when Dick Tracy, the 
the Game Boy Dick Tracy came out, or, okay. or NES Dick Tracy. So, the, because I was working with that guy then, and that's kind of my mental. Sure. The, the Gravis card had just come out. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and I think I think I had just done. Uh, I think I had just done Wing Commander. Mm. Okay. Also, so 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 that 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 gives an idea too, yeah. because I believe it was at that first one that they had the first awards for okay. video games, okay. and the sound award went to Wing Commander, and okay. I and they brought the producer up, and I did one of those things where I stood up and you know I got up and went and stood next to him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> dedicated the award to Dave Govett, who was right now had been called up and might be going to to Iran, you know. Wow. So, I, yeah, I did one of those things, and I didn't get a copy of the award, so I made up my own certificates and had had Chris sign them. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> what a guy! I, I sometimes wish I wasn't wearing this suit because I could, so I could look at that guy and go, "What's his wit? What?" Um, so later, uh, as the community started to develop, mm -hmm. uh, I would I felt like I had a role in it and 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 i would call the jams i would i would make sure that that musicians would get together game musicians would get together and jam and i'd have uh uh rogue jam sessions at the at the developer conferences too and boy those were something yeah. so <laughs> then that uh, another group uh, uh would have like the informal um they they'd reserve a room at the GDC, which was easier to do in those days. And all the audio people would go in. It was kind of like audio town hall. And there was a certain amount of like, hey, does anyone have any problems that are working on? Hey, let's talk about things, you know, let's share. And uh, it looked like it was winding down that, that one year. And Tom Reddig, Tom White, uh, who else was, was at the front? Um, just some... Um, I'm trying to remember. They're trying to get this get get this together. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, they uh, uh, it looked like the the meeting was winding down, and I had this idea that you know that I was working too hard to try to write different versions of different things, and I was having to do MIDI and sometimes audio. Uh, and couldn't and some for some games could handle audio and some games could handle MIDI. Why did I need two systems? And I thought of this idea that if you could, it's basically like like in Nuendo when you use a sampler track. Mm -hmm. It's like wow, if we could have MIDI control of audio files of any length, then we could, you know, we could. It would be a general solution. You could either do short notes and do composition like MIDI compositions, or you could do long notes and use the MIDI to control the interactivity of the things. Yeah. So something something like that. And then if there were uh, interactivity, it would be written in a standard language, MIDI, that everybody could have access to. So if there's a standard language also that would incorporate um, the rules of interactivity for a game, um, then that would be to... Uh, to game audio, to interactive audio, what MIDI is to linear music, or what you know ASCII is to typing, you know it would it would do a couple of functions at first, but once it happened, the possibilities would be endless. Once you blew it into a computer and started manipulating the data and turned it loose to the programmers, so that was kind of my concept. And I had I had further elaborations on where that could go, but I brought it up, and the people from oh. Uh, one of the major sound companies, sound sound uh, card companies, said, "Oh, George, we've got. You mean uploadable samples? We've got that under control." And someone else said, "Yeah, uploadable samples. What do you guys think about uploadable samples? If they if they <laughs> downloadable, uploadable. They they use the terms interchangeably." And the meeting caught fire. It wasn't exactly what I was talking about, um, but it really took off, and people got very excited about it. And I came back later and. Mark Miller, Tom Reddig, Tom White, and a couple of other guys, hardworking, smart, uh, 
uh, what would I call well-behaved uh, <laughs> people were, were saying, well, maybe we should form an organization, you know, and I had gone off and gotten a beer and came back and like, oh, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're thinking about forming another organization. Oh, that IA SIG stands for I actually started it, George. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I didn't really start it. But I, but I, I catalyzed it somehow. You were a part so of it, though. I, yeah. I was, uh, yeah, and I was a part of it. And uh, uh, so th that organization uh, formed under the MIDI Manufacturers Association, under the MMA. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there was some fun and some meetings and, and things like that. And uh, you're going to have to edit the heck out of this, aren't you? <laughs> nah, not really. Right. <laughs> the audio <laughs> version made a long show. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so th that uh, uh, so that that group started. Uh, what was it that they handled? They they uh, uh, they were looking at the, first of all the downloadable samples mm. um, and trying to make a, a, a standard for those. Yeah. And while they were doing that, um, I had done the first general MIDI game, which was Seventh Guest. Mm. And okay. so, when and I made a big deal about how great General MIDI was in the instruction packet in the manual for the game. And thank mm -hmm. you to Trilobite for taking a chance on this new format. Hopefully, we won't have to, you know, this will play on future sound cards. Haven't even been invented yet. Thank you, thank you. And you know, it's like two pages long. <laughs> And then, and then, but there, were, there was only one general MIDI sound card. So when other ones came out and Seventh Guest played on them, it d didn't sound good. And that was because there, the standard didn't cover how loud instruments should be compared to each other. Uh. So the mix was random and it didn't cover how fast the attack speeds should be. So if you played a fast riff on a slow attack violin, say, yeah, you, you hear nothing. So I'm mm. like, I, I owe something to the world here. So... And, and also, people were coming up with sound cards, and they wanted me. They they wanted me to endorse them, and I, so I was picturing sound cards coming out with my picture on the box, right? And then, <laughs> yeah, because I'm that way, and uh, or I was. I don't yeah. know. Maybe I probably still am. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I pictured it sounding bad, and that's a bad thing. So we started Fat Labs, and we were going to test the sound cards and make sure that they sounded like the sound canvas did or at least you know when you mm -hmm. write on the sound canvas the music would play in a similar balance well spanky bless her heart put out a press release that said there's a new standard you know <laughs> this is the new standard and she sent it out to everybody and so in the in the ia sig meetings it was like what is George doing? You can't just declare a standard. You know, I mean, Tom White, he's running the MMA. You know, they're in charge if they know what a standard is. We didn't know what a standard was. Um, so we had this, uh, so we, that was how I got in with that group and, and started having a lot of interaction with the, with the IA SIG and, and with trying to get some consensus about how to make General MIDI work because it didn't work. Um, yeah. And so I made a lot of friends and uh, smoothed over some some animosity. Uh, and I, th I think it all leveled out pretty well. And <laughs> it also led to the think tank conferences. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, through the so people were asking me, well, what's the future of sound cards? Because it was really kind of a jumbly mess, and they would crash the computers mm -hmm. more than anything else would crash the computers. Uh, so I said, well, the, the future of sound cards is, oh, I don't know. Well, maybe you should ask Tom. No, he wouldn't know because he doesn't write. Them. Maybe, you know, it would take a bunch of people. It would take, and I started getting this idea of a group brain. Mm -hmm. um, and so me and, me and Spanky came up with the idea of, you know, let's get these guys together and let's get them some, uh, you know, let's get them some instruments to jam on. Let's get them somewhere out in Texas, away from the fluorescent lights. Uh, let's get them a bunch of toys to play with. Let you know. Let's have some cigars and some scotch, and and let's make it a party. And then we'll brainstorm. We'll solve the problems, and it'll be great. And and the weird thing was, it actually that happened. Tom yeah. White came out to make sure that we didn't get in trouble. You know, to make sure we didn't mess things up. So yeah. our so Project Barbecue 
became like a sister organization to IA SIG after a couple little tussles back and forth. Mm. Um, it became, um, we were like the speedboat. We go out and explore uncharted territory. And then we bring our discoveries back to the more legitimate organizations. So if there's a standards organization, we would make sure that they got our findings. If there was, mm -hmm. a, you know, something like the IA SIG, um, you know, that, that, that they, could, they could work out things within that community. So the IA SIG, uh, and, and, and Linda became the chairman of the IA SIG for a good long time. Okay. Uh, so their function was uh, not, it was not the social function, although there was social stuff there. It was not the MIDI manufacturers. It was the interactive audio and it was the technical side and, you know, where there is, uh, where we've all got to get on the same page. That was, that was what they did. So they would, they took up the, uh, the downloadable samples uh, they took up uh, the, uh, the education. Uh, Michael Sweet had a yeah. nice role in that and, and spearheaded getting them into trying to put our, our accumulated knowledge all in one place on, a, uh, on the World Wide Web, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, The net. <laughs> uh, we also had, interestingly, uh, the, the Fat General Solution, um, actually got pretty far the aspect of having a standard file format for the interactivity of a game. Um, that was called the IXMF working group. Hmm. And I've got a picture of the luminaries who met on that. And it included all three LucasArts stooges. Hmm. Um, it included uh, uh, Oh, Chris Grigg and and my brother Rick, who's kind of a who was a computer whiz at the time, and um, it, it was a it was a I think Brian Schmidt might have been there. Oh, um, okay, but it was a lot of smart people. And if I had yeah. been better at programming, if I really knew anything about modern program, I I learned to learn to program in in ancient languages back in the day. <laughs> um, you know, maybe I could have been of some actual use to them, but it it it's it floundered at, it got very far. It needed approval. Chris Grigg did the lion's share of the work with a lot of input from everybody else. Uh, but somebody needed to work on it and somebody needed to give feedback into it. I believe it's still frozen in carbonite somewhere. Um, you know, the, the, how, however far we got. But the idea is that if you could save a file out of WISE and read it into FMOD, or into um, what's the one uh, the Elias? Um, then, if you had that, just having that file and being able to manipulate it with the computer in some smart way, um, it really opens up the possibilities of doing interactive audio. So the, all those things exist, and that's the kind of role that the IA Sig uh, would play. So where there are uh, tough nuts to crack it, 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 a lot of it used to be trying to keep the computer trying to keep the sound cards from crashing the computer <laughs> you know and if you started. take it yeah and you take mm -hmm. it from there and, and move on into it takes too many you know one of clint bajakian's uh things that he brought up at barbecue which i, I don't think it quite made it to the isa was it takes a lot of clicks for me to 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 be able to do what I want to to express what I want to express musically on the computer. Can we? How do would we approach fixing that? <laughs> and I suppose there would be some AI answers now. Um, dangerous territory, but mm -hmm. interesting territory. Uh, coming up with a common vocabulary for interactive audio. Mm -hmm. um, you know things like that are mm -hmm. really good. Uh, cases for the for the IA SIG, mm -hmm. and getting in there, and, and for a musician to get in there, uh, or a, a sound designer uh, to get into that community, they would be in a position where they would have the ear of a community, they would have a brain, group brain power of a community, and they would be able to influence the issues. They'd be able to take responsibility for the issues that are slowing them down. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's kind of how I see. Uh, 
the the IA SIG, and I and I I could not be more pleased that Chase is uh, is taking a role in that because yeah. because we started chatting about what kind of uh, what kind of possibilities for the future there are, um, and I think he's got the he's got the stuff. Yeah, you know whatever the stuff is. I mean, mm-hmm. he, he, I think he's, he, he can, he sees what's actually here and he can smell the future, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's leaning yeah. forward a little bit. He's like, Oh, just around the corner. Here's some really sweet, sweet world for the game audio. Mm-hmm. For Interactive audio. Chase Bethia. Yeah. I'm not quite sure his title with IASIG now, but I know that he's, 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 he's it's in the role that my ex-wife Okay. Had that, that Linda Law had, and uh, in between Linda and Chase, it was uh, Kurt Hyden for for many years. Okay. Um, yeah. But uh, I think that it's it's time for for a new generation and a new t- a, a new group of people to to grab this thing. I think it's a good setup. I think it's it's going to feel at first like inheriting an old car and and it's like <laughs> now let now let's hot rod this thing now yeah. let's hook up the nitro exactly. you know <laughs> yeah because it's a good old car yeah yeah and i don't think it needs to be torn to the ground i think that there's enough there that people will be able to uh, uh to take it somewhere that i never dreamed of yeah 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 um a couple of times, just some of the notes that I jotted down here. Um, you mentioned the jam sessions that you started at GDC and other places where you would have jam sessions. Now, when I go to a jam, you know, if I'm at a conference now and I go to a jam, a lot of times they're playing video game music. Is that what you guys were playing then too? Or were you jamming on like the Beatles and stuff? Oh, the Beatles and stuff. Yeah. Dad rock. Um, <laughs> I, I, but Your you know, words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well so some of the great things ah uh, great moments in the jam um you know brian schmidt you you have you interviewed him oh yes yeah, I, I just is, talked to him today not in person but yeah yeah i know brian is, is is he a little bit smart do you think oh my god <laughs> yes what do you yes. think i mean i'd like to get a second opinion i think your yeah. assessment is correct yes yeah, yeah, <laughs> he's a yeah. wise, I, smart guy when when I was when when I was running audio at Magic Leap, he was he was uh, among the very first people that I brought in, mm. uh, and boy was I lucky to get him. Yeah, he was fantastic. Yeah. Well, w- one of the highlights was that when uh, uh, who was it Activision or whoever stopped making the Leisure Suit Larry games, for whatever reason, um, there it was a good franchise in its way, uh, you know. <laughs> it's it it's time had not run out yet it has run out now this is not the time for the larry the, the larry franchise but uh in the day they stopped it just for those random reasons that that game companies stopped them and so we had a wake yes. for leisure suit larry oh. and uh and it was a it was a spectacular jam and one of the highlights was actually the guitar player from night ranger showed up <laughs> and he went to Linda, who was running the clipboard, and she told him, well, you have to put your name on the clipboard if you want to get up there. So he walked out. <laughs> Another good one was that Brian Schmidt, maybe you don't know this, but he's uh, he is the Bootsy in a Funkadelic cover band. What? And when, when Brian and, and when we were talking at Magic Leap about... Uh, imposter syndrome yeah. you know me, me and brian and and uh stefan schutz and a couple of other folks were talking about you know imposter syndrome you know how we all kind of feel like wow you know we're not bringing everything to the table that we could and these other people around me they're so smart and, he, and i said brian you get it too he said oh i get it bad and i said well you must be in the bootsy guy in a in a funkadelic band and he goes oh no that i can do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian, anyway having brian play his bootsy riffs in one of those jams was just fantastic uh and uh going to brian moriarty who is one of the top game designers and mm. you know that you, you've heard stories about the about the uh uh gdc how 
you know, meet in the bar. That's where it's all happening. Yeah. And in, yeah. in one of those, in one of those prototypical bars where it was yeah. like, oh my God, there's, there's Brian and he's talking to, I, I can't even think of like four other names, but it, you know, it was a Noah Falstein and, and there's uh you know, there's uh, Graham Devine and, you know, the, all these great designers are sitting around yeah. and, and Brian's got his whiskey and he's the intellect, you know, <laughs> and uh, he because he later he worked with with Spielberg on, you know, when Spielberg got into games and, and uh, you know, he, he always gave our most like transcendental philosophical lectures at GDC. He's amazing. Yeah. And uh, he said, I, I don't I don't play with live bands. I, I do karaoke. <laughs> And uh, and and uh, I said, well, you ought to think about it. You know, you ought to think about coming out and jamming. You know, just sing a song. We'll be your karaoke machine. And uh, so we went out, and went out, and talked a little bit more, and had a couple more whiskeys. And I looked over at him about like forty-five minutes later, and I said, "You're thinking about the jam right now, aren't you?" And he goes, "I'm thinking which tune I'm going to do." <laughs> <laughs> and he did "Sympathy for the Devil." Oh God. <laughs> and he did a mighty fine job of that. And actually, we became very good friends from from that point on. And he would Funny. report in. And he'd say, I don't do karaoke anymore. I have a jam band now. <laughs> you changed his life. I changed his life. <laughs> and he yours. I'm he sure. mine many, many ways. He was the producer for Loom. So he's the guy who chose mm. those seven movements of Swan Lake for me to do. And a okay. wiser more subtle decision could never have been made he's a guy he was hanging out at at lucas uh at skywalker ranch on his 21st birthday and he had his first legal drink <laughs> he goes over and opens the case and takes out the holy grail <laughs> from <laughs> not from, from monty Ra python and from, radars. Guy, from raiders from radars from radars yeah. yeah raiders yeah. though yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> amazing <laughs> Up of a carpenter. <laughs> Boom. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. We had him. We, we, he hired uh, Team Fat for a, for a gig. Now, he was our record company. He always wanted to be a record company. So when we put out our three little CDs, he was secretly our, our record company, did all the art and, and, and whatever little bit of distribution. Uh, but we were working on a gig with him. Oh my gosh, was it that gig? Oh boy, I think he might have been at 3DO and might have gotten us this weird comedy gig where we were supposed to be in the game as the pit band, the cowboy clad surf rock pit band for a communist game show in which if you won it, you could take over a country. Again, not the time for that one, but it was a pretty hilarious game. And, and he came out to visit us in Austin and we had that intellectual Bostonian, uh, we had him out on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> looking, looking happy and uncomfortable. It was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful guy. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Did I lose the thread? I say great place. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't think there really is a thread. Uh. So I'm I'm good. I'm good with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. When uh, and my brain just keeps bouncing around like pinball, which is another thing that makes me think of Brian. But um. Hmm. I think that with seventh guest, because that was 90, 90, was that? I don't know. Let's I'm looking, Google. I'm looking. I, I don't, you, we don't even have to Google. I've already got it. 93, oh. 93. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I was in so high school. Mm -hmm. uh, 93. Um, you know, the thing, because it's a, it's like interactive no novel, right? It's it's you're right. literally like turning the pages in the story. That was so crazy it's innovative that game. That so when Wing cool. Commander was too. I don't know how I landed in the in the in the sweet spot for both of those. And weirdly, they were both the the like very very first games to use interstitials. You like, know the the what do you call those cutscenes? Yeah. Yeah, we didn't know what yeah. to call them. In Seventh Guest, we didn't have a name for them. So I suggested, let's call it a finite amount of theater. <laughs> I, lo I don't mean to laugh, but that's, it's an no, absurd, that's an absurd thing to call it. But it's a beautiful thing. Well, to call yeah, yeah, yeah. It, so I, 
F A P. Don't miss that. <laughs> finite amounts of theater. Is that what you said? Fi- a finite amount of theater. You Beautiful. Know, come on, guys, yeah. let's. Yeah. <laughs> so this is what happens in between scenes, right? You know, yeah. it's one of the things just that. <laughs> I've been watching the Golden Girls lately. I've been fall I fall asleep to the Golden Girls. This awesome. is a new thing. Normally, I don't fall asleep to TV, but it's a new whatever. It's not new. It's been around for a long time. The Golden yeah. Girls. <laughs> the, the Golden Girls has been around for a very long time, late eighties. So, uh, the what cracks me up is their interstitials because they have. Uh, Speaking of a finite amount, they have a finite amount of interstitials for the all seven seasons, and none of them are very, <clears throat> pardon me, none of them are very melancholic. So if they're dealing with a really serious subject, they'll have oh this God. kind of like peppy, like old ladies <sighs> living together in Miami interstitial, and then it's like somebody's dying, or it's just it cracks oh, me up. Oh, nice! It cracks me up. But that's you know that was in the late eighties and. They probably were like, we just need these 13 interstitials. We can make that last for seven seasons, no problem. But anyway. (laughs) You were talking about, I totally hijacked it. You were talking about some guest. Oh, yeah. And and then... And then I interrupted you and said, I can't believe that was so innovative. Yeah. And you were saying, oh, because it was interactive. uh, Yeah, it was was interactive drama. Yeah, which, you know, even now I would say is kind of a niche side of gaming really i mean it's this very dedicated world of gaming but it's you know i mean when people think of video games they don't think of interactive novels i don't think but but the seventh guest was that's just like that that took over the world really i mean certainly the country and you know just talk to me if you if you would about just the music um in in that kind of setting compared to, you know, Wing Commander or compared to just more action-y kinds of games where, you know, you're really supporting a narrative in a different way than you would be in maybe something with more action or something, you know? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. no, that's a good question. I, I mean, the, the approach that I took, you know, the, the Wing Commander moments are all moments. Now, Wing, mm. Commander, Wing Commander 2, there were some character themes Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, wink, but seventh guest, I, I drew a grid and, yeah. uh, it was based on the, the seven guests more or less. And that was, you know, that was a vertical and then, okay. you know, and, and then each, each one of them got, uh, a key and this, I was gonna, I was gonna dig into my, in, into my, you know, classical music yeah thing so each of them yeah. got a, a key and a style and an instrument and a motif nice and then it's like okay now that that's established at least on paper you know written um then then now i now i can go and oh, okay so now it's just a matter of actually making the music so that i can be like wagner um the, you know, the only thing that's missing is the music. Okay, and what I found, what I found was that uh, when there were, by making it character based, um, it it worked really well, and I I got very. Uh, it's like, it, if there's a scene where these sort of, not spectacular. You know, if you're watching any of the cutscenes from from Seventh Guest, you know it, it feels it has this beauty to it, which, but it, it's melodramatic. It's over yeah. the top, and uh, I found what really worked was just to like uh, score the scene, and whenever one of those characters was forward, I would dip into their uh, their bag of elements, throw them on the the daw, you know, throw throw them into the tune. And then if they were interacting with somebody else, I'd grab a couple of other elements and throw those in. And sometimes you get half ostrich and half elephant. You get a lost elephant or something. <laughs> and uh, but it, it would work beautifully. Mm-hmm. And and so uh, if there was an action moment that had to do with the characters, I would play up the action. Uh, I had sort of a dolls theme, and the dolls played big uh, 
in the thing. I don't even remember. And and Stoff, I guess the the main bad guy. Uh, that would be kind of the main thing. So I just threw the themes at it, and I and I found that by having that much strictness, that one little grid, that everything else could be very loose, and I didn't really have to follow it. I would just go in there and grab some of that and throw it in and then write music out of that and 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 go for feel. Yeah. And and those little elements held it together uh in enough of a way that you could read into it what you needed to read into it. Which by mm-hmm. the way Brian Moriarty gave a speech on the secret of why the Beatles are awesome. And it's okay. called Who Buried Paul and it is totally worth watching and and at the end of the day the answer is i'll cut right to the chase here's the takeaway you give the people enough uh chaos there's enough music but there's enough chaos that they can look into it they can constellate from the parts what what they need to see they can see the pictures you know they can they can they can turn it into what they what they need to get out of it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and so a little bit of that was happening in seventh guest yeah. Thanks for asking that question. I hope that answers it some. No, it does. I, you know, I'm always fascinated by that, just that genre of gaming. You know, I mean, I just find it, find it fascinating because I, I feel like as far as games go, that appeals to quite a broad, quite a broad audience because you get your puzzlers, you get your readers, you know, you get the people who love the story, all of those things. Well, just, yeah. Yeah, and and let's go back to 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 part of what made it fun was that I didn't have it. I mean, you talk about it as a genre. To me, I don't think it was a genre yet. No, no, it wasn't. Not no. So because it was the first sort of game made for CD-ROM, the first game with this this much content in it, um, that had to be on a CD-ROM, and and it was the first like like it was the 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 CD-ROM game before that that had sold top was uh, Sherlock Holmes adventures. It did 20,000 copies. Wow. And then, and then seventh guest did a million and a half copies right out of the box. And it was a brand new thing. There hadn't been anything that lush, you know, with scenes and, and, mm-hmm. and, and it was MIDI music, but it even had little bits of real music. And I was so excited by that, that I made 20 extra music out, minutes of music outside of the contract, you know, because, we figured out that this new thing, the CD-ROM, it could play, you know, CD music. They had to check to see if it would do it. Um, And uh, so if you put the game disc into your CD player and don't play the first track, because it'll go, but you go past it, (laughs) then you could hear all this, uh, all this real music with lyrics and stuff. And I was Mm -hmm. so, and I thought, wow, this is a great, great opportunity to get in front of a audience with, with voice and songwriting and stuff. Uh, but but there was no yep. genre and I wasn't fulfilling any expectations. So that was right. really fun. Yep. So I got to dip into my uh, my West Side Story chops and my Twilight Zone chops and my Beatles chops and my, you know, Bo Diddley and Doors and, and whatever, <laughs> whatever I could think of. Mm-hmm. Uh, there might have been some Calypso in there. Uh, just anything. Yeah. Uh, as long as it's a little a little scary or surrealistic. <laughs> well, I think and I it love, works. yeah, and I love that there are songs because even now it's depending on the game, you're probably not going to hear a song with lyrics, you know. And I I love that. So tell me tell me more about that decision. Well, you know that was, I think I made a lot of decisions based on hey, this is a dumb idea, but it's but it's <laughs> it's for the good. Yeah, and, you know this is this is stupid. Let's do it. <laughs> Uh, and and there was always this sort of how can I the what is beautiful in life the Beatles are beautiful in life how can mm-hmm. I bring that kind of beauty uh, and that's that's why Brian Moriarty's talk was so great for me how can I bring that, that was the prime directive how can I bring th- something that approaches that um, and songs with lyrics I mean I'm not saying that my songs you know, stand up alongside, let it be or something, but, um, but let's go there. 
You know, let's let's push in that direction and let's write something that has some, you know, nothing does it like songs. And so I just did it. Um, and that has continued with me. And I, I would say that if I have a place now in the game audio world, uh, do you know Adam Gubman? I do. Have you? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So, mm-hmm. so when he, he, he's, uh, when he does a lyric song for games, I get to be his lyricist. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and he can choose from some good lyricists. You know, he's, he, he, you know that he did that, uh, that song, This Is Me, from the, he produced the song from, from uh, The Greatest Showman. Oh, I did this not know that. A award winning thing. And he does these, uh, he produces Disney shows for, uh, you know, yeah. that they go at the Hollywood Bowl, and he he writes songs that they do at the at the parades, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, he he he's uh, he's doing those things. But mm-hmm. but uh, but he he we work together. We've worked together on a whole bunch of lyricy things. Oh, cool. Oh, there have been some good ones too. There have been like. Uh, um, some of these little games that mm-hmm. that you wouldn't think much about, you know, these little uh, uh, mobile games uh, and stuff. Mobile mobile games that are like mm-hmm. meant for uh, they're puzzle games, but they're they're you know success stories for women. You know of you know you you're a, a detective or you've you know you're just an apprentice at a pet hospital and you're working your way up and it's going to become your pet hospital and that kind of thing mm-hmm. um one of them was <clears throat> worlds it was a contest between the dads but uh, between the husbands because the, okay. the women were together they were bragging about who's got the most incompetent husband you know well my my husband can't even do this he can't even do this yeah. they're, they're complaining about so, so they have a contest who's the best you know yeah and uh who's the best who's the worst and uh, the drama that unfolds is that one of the couples, um, they're going to have a, the, the, the woman's pregnant. And they were, they were going to get married, but the, the man decides, the, the, the young man, he decides he's not going to do it. He's too scared to have a baby. But then he decides, he, and he's a musician. He's kind of a crummy musician. <laughs> And he decides he's gonna um, he's gonna marry her anyway, and he writes her a song about it. And I get to write that song, and then she says, "No, with that attitude, you're not going to. What you're gonna do is I'm gonna have the kid, and you're gonna babysit it. At some point, you're gonna watch the kid. And in the process of the game, he watches the kid. He falls in love with the kid. He realizes what's there. Mm-hmm. He rewrites the song. Oh, cool. And he sings that." And I get to write that. Nice. So the first one is all like, baby, baby, it's you and me. You know, even though we have a kid, it's going to be great anyway. <laughs> yeah. And the second one is baby, baby, I love you. You know, yeah. baby, when I look in your eyes, it's, you know. So, uh, yeah, some of those beautiful things. Um, great opportunity for, for a songwriting mm-hmm. experience. Mm-hmm. Uh I mean, if, if 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 we're not too much running out of time, uh, another one. Uh, there's a, a detective, a female detective, mm-hmm. whose dad uh, was a tough cop, and and he died. She's got an enemy, a, uh, an attorney, who just can't stand her. She can't stand him. The attorney has a daughter. So all he cares about, and. She had that relationship with her dad, which was very big to her. So they meet at the funeral, mad at each other. Oh, what are you doing here? Mm-hmm. But they start drinking. A tune comes on for the dad for the funeral. Yeah, and it has to touch their hearts, and they decide that they they like each other enough. They're going to work for work with each other and crack cases. And I get to write that song, so it's about. The relationship between a dad and a daughter it's oh, a tender nice. side and about you know uh who 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 will who will kiss my daughter when i go out to see you know it, it, so it's kind of the um it's a great opportunity anyway yeah. i just love love doing those things 
Yeah. It's so fun. You know, you've um, not, I didn't mean to cut you off if I did, um, uh, but you've been, talk, you've talked about the Beatles a few times. And, you know, if you go to your YouTube page, which you've been putting up videos <laughs> since like YouTube was born, it's amazing. <laughs> Um, so that's th- that there's a lot of content there. But you also have recently, I think last year was maybe your newest one, you did these deep dives. Oh, into, my gosh. Yeah, yeah, which this is fun. And I noticed, I'm like, these are like, almost all of these are Beatles tunes. And so, you know, it's clear that, you know, you obviously you admire their music. And if you're able to make, you know, six videos about one song deep diving, it's pretty obvious that those songs are great, obviously. But... Um, just tell me a little bit about, I guess, what, you know, what they were like for you. You talked about it a little bit earlier, how, you know, it was the help Beatles, the movie, oh. maybe the movie Beatles. But I just, you know, love to know more about their influence on you musically. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Thank you for asking that. Um, sure. They're uh, so it's maybe a little hard for someone who's uh, who's younger who didn't experience it um to to know how much more uh more popular they were than just anybody i mean they they were seriously the the world's eyes were on these four people mm-hmm. uh and they were also uh stupidly talented for their uh for their age Mm-hmm. Uh, they were ridiculously intertwined with each other. They had a, you know, the, interacting with each other. They had a great look. Um, they were way ahead of of things musically in so many ways. They were their arrangements were elegant. They had an incredible team behind them. It was just the perfect storm, uh, and and it, everything that they do bears close scrutiny. But there was something intangible. The there was a, a humor to them. That when that you know that the world lit up when you were watching them, and and you and you felt like you were getting, like you were you were seeing into another space. Uh, it was akin to when I was uh, in middle school, hanging out with the cool kids in the high school band because I got drafted into high school band two years early. Nice. So I was hearing these these people joking about you know making my first you know, dirty jokes and, and, and making their first, you know, plans to, you know, we need to, we need no one to park here so that we can do marching band practice, you know, and the, and the, and the director goes, well, uh, you know, it'd be great if there was a red curb out there. Um, there's some red paint in the closet. Need I say more, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm like, am I saying, can we, is this okay? <laughs> you know, <laughs> is this what life is like? <laughs> um, and, and you get that feeling when you're looking at the Beatles, and, and mm-hmm. I had that, and and uh, so I tracked it down uh, musically, spiritually, humorously. I tried to do it with with a, a look, but couldn't pull that off. You know, I didn't have the hair for it. Um, but uh, actually, whenever uh, you know, I let myself be guided by that, and and by uh, also by that band director who was that kind of rascal. Um, in fact, that's uh, that. Vintage Telly was was his. Uh, I'm not uh, kidding. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, the the the, uh, the the thing is, if you could do things one way or another way, and this other way was the way the Beatles did it, then you did it the way the Beatles did it. <laughs> so you know, if you could, mm-hmm. so uh, because that's that's the clunky way of bringing that uh, love and that light, that's your first, it's like, well, what'll I do? Well, I'll just imitate them mm. or I'll just wallow in that vibe and that vibe will get on me. And, and even though I can't understand it intellectually, uh, whatever it is, I know it's good. It shone through a dark time. There wasn't really, TV wasn't that great. When it was great, it wasn't enlightening. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't really going to church you know, I went to Hebrew school and temple and stuff like that but it really wasn't it didn't get through to me when the Beatles sang those things you know yeah uh, when I think what about what was that 
I, you know, when I think about um, some of my favorite music through time, whether it's yeah, do it Bach or Bjork or whatever it whatever it might be, or a Beatles song, you know, and I can listen to it over and over again, and um, you know, whether it's the simplicity or the flute line or whatever it might be. Uh, you know, I can, as, as much as I love all kinds of musics, I can pretty easily go, okay, here's some of my favorite stuff that I wish everybody knew. So when, you know, when you think about the Beatles catalog and as large as it is, um, you know, what are some of those moments for you in their catalog where you feel like this is the most perfect song everything about this song is perfect if they had added that's an, something yeah that's Tell an me. issue that's an issue because <laughs> uh, because there's no quintessential beatles song okay <laughs> yeah because it because they're they're their whole over yeah morphs through time but it does when I, okay when i was first picking up guitar i had a buddy ron michelson he was like my best buddy for years, all through high school and, yeah. and a lot in middle school. And in middle school, I'd go and visit him. We'd you know, play Marco Polo in the pool. We'd play, we'd play pool in the Marco Polo. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't make any <laughs> sense. But, but he would put on Beatles records. He had kind of a renaissance. You know, I mean, at first it was my babysitter, you know, brought us the singles and we'd listen to those, you know, as okay. little kids. Yeah. But when Ron, he'd put on them. He, he he's got he's a little bit on the spectrum you know he's a he's a freeway designer and uh uh and he's an avid beetle fan and he would put on tax man and he'd say and he'd look right at me and he'd go me tell you how it will be tax man and then and then when you know when it come around it, you know second verse he'd like you know the, oh the tambourines come in and then, ah, ah mr wilson and then when that verse comes around where they're doing the, the background vocals, Frere Shaka, you know, they're singing Frere Shaka as a background for that. And I'm like, so it was this energy. It was like, yeah. listen to the, listen, you know, mm -hmm. and, and Ron and I, I, I don't think we were in a band yet, but that way we formed our first band with, with him and me. And we, and, and we got our buddy Paul to play bass and, and my brother, my, our, we, my mom made us play with my brother, who later went on to get like seven Grammys playing with Sleep. Oh, that brother. Okay. That brother. <laughs> David, right? David, very yeah. good. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, so that was that's one like Beatle moment. Here's another Beatle moment. Yeah. I was in college. Ravi Shankar comes to my college, Occidental oh, shut College. Up. You know. Oh wow. Oh yeah, you know that. Oh yeah. And uh, and Ron happened to be visiting. Okay. Uh, he he had visiting me. He went he went to another college. Uh, he happened to be visiting, so we went to see Ravi Shankar, free concert in the chapel. We heard that there, and there was going to be a dinner afterwards downstairs, Indian food, all free, you know, just donate. Hmm. And we heard George Harrison was going to be there. Oh, my God. Wow. So, so yeah, so we, we grab our little, I don't know what this is, but yeah, <laughs> there he is, there he is. Okay, so I went over to him. And Ron, bless his heart, you know, positioned himself behind me so that he could see George through my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I say, I say, uh, hi, my name's George. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, hey, we have something in common, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. yeah. Uh, you know, my name's George. I, I wonder if you'd like to, you know, to talk about music or in, in things. And he goes, well, I'm eating my dinner right now. I go, well, maybe later. And he goes, why don't you go eat your dinner? So me and Ron, we run back up the hill to my dorm. And we get out the Beatle records. And we try to find songs that are about food. <laughs> <laughs> so we can decode the secret message. <laughs> did you find it? Oh, yeah, we did. Uh, <laughs> Savoy Truffle. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a song that uh, George wrote for uh for Eric Clapton to let oh, him know wow. he was going to get sick and wreck his body eating all that candy. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a great uh, Beatle moment 
this isn't my Beatle moment. I got to tell this one, though. You know Marty O'Donnell? Marty O'Donnell, yes. So I, I tried to hire him into Magic Leap as well. Okay. And uh, he got a little busy after we decided, yeah, you know, let's let's talk about this. Let's move on this. So he, he got another thing going on. But he did come out, and uh, he, he told the story because he had been working with Sir Paul. That's right. And doing a good job of it too. Yeah. And uh, he was bumming out because he he you know that adventure happened. And Sir yeah. Paul, every he's everything you'd you'd want him to be. Uh, you know, he calls up Marty. He says, "Hey, Marty, I heard you, you know, having a little trouble there, and I just thought I'd reach out." Marty goes, "Oh yeah." He says, "Thanks, Paul." He says, "It must be very hard." He says, "Yeah, you know, these guys were my my buddies. They were my mates. You know, it feels like the band broke up." And then he goes, "Did I?" Just- <laughs> Did I just? Did you just say that to Paul McCartney? (laughs) To Paul McCartney, (laughs) who, for our younger listeners, knows what it's like when a band breaks up. He knows. (laughs) He knows. And 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 actually, when I when I uh, brought Marty in to meet our big boss, Mm -hmm. uh, in that in the short moment that we had with the big boss to try to get hired there, uh, Marty plays. it, It came up, and Marty played a phone message that he had on his. Honest thing from Paul McCartney. Oh, Hello, Malty. This is this is Paul from England. <laughs> <laughs> and the boss looks at me and winks, and he says, "Well, I guess we gotta we gotta hire him." It's the, it's the McCartney rule. So and Marty goes, "What's the McCartney rule?" He says, "If anyone has a message from Paul McCartney on their phone, we have to hire him. It's the rule around here. Even if it's made up, even if it's if it's, if, if it's an impersonator, we have to do it." <laughs> Just put that on your resume. Yeah, put that on your resume. <laughs> I mean, it works. If it works, it works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Beatles. Uh, the Beatles. I. 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 I um, we're just so blessed to live in a world that has those guys in it, and there are so many mm-hmm. other people that that you know that are that are wonderful. But somehow the Beatles resonate for me, and I think mm-hmm. that if other people out there, hello, I'm looking at you. If there's something that resonates like that for you, and it doesn't have to be Beatles, you know. It, it, it can be, uh, you know, it can be, I'm going to go Queen B and I can't think of what her name is. Beyonce? Uh, Beyonce, Queen yeah. B? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that Queen B? That Queen yeah. B. Yeah. It could be her, okay? It could be Kendrick. Uh, you know, the, it, Kendrick. These, these powerful things mm-hmm. that, 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 that speak to you in that invisible world. Because when you, uh, uh, what, what art does is, is that it's playing this, uh, this communication game where without words or with abstract words, it, it's putting a feeling from one person's heart into, into yours. Um, and it affirms that there's an invisible world, you know, when this magic happens. And if that mm-hmm. magic is happening for you, tune into it. It's important. There's a lot more invisible world than there is visible world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense to tune in. And it's, this is practical advice, uh, and that may be part of what I got out of that may be the bottom line, Emily, about, you know, when you're asking me about the Beatles or even the monkeys, mm-hmm. um, you know, what's the takeaway? And the takeaway is there's an invisible world going on. Pay attention to it. When it speaks to you, when you sit up in bed and go, oh, my God, I could wear beetle boots. They'd fit. You know, I could play uh, if I turn up the treble, then it'll tickle people's <laughs> ears. You know, if I write the the lyrics that are the that are the plans for a submarine, you know, just whatever makes your heart just go wow, mm-hmm. then then pay attention to it. Don't necessarily do it, but but it's the it's the muses speaking to you, and there and it's yeah. there is power in that that will make that will bless every aspect of your normal life. Yeah, and I think too, it's important to remember to listen. Like you're saying, you know, follow those things and don't listen to what other people say about them. If, you know, because that's hard too. If, if you really love something and people are like, well, that's no good, you should be listening to this. Mm. Uh, that can, it that tells can be you something about, yeah, it can't, it tells you something about them. Yeah, it definitely. Tells you what, what, what they're hearing and what they're tuned into. Mm-hmm. And sometime you may need them, you know, you may need yeah. that attitude. But for right now, that's just information. There are different. Different people are tuned into different things at different times. At our core, we're all the same. uh, There's a moment when you may have to do your taxes. (laughs) 
I'm on extension. I still have three months. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't meant to. Yes. That How I know. I know? Ah, see the invisible world. Maybe just I get two these months. messages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you'll make it. You'll, you'll be good. Yeah, I mean, I I grew up in a, with a mom who loves the Beatles. Um, she she isn't a you know she didn't make music her life or anything. Um, but I definitely got a lot of Beatles from her, which was nice. And for her, it was always the harmony. She just loved oh my goodness. to sing the harmony. You know, she she was an alto, or she is an alto. So she just loved singing those harmony lines. And I think that that refined my ear as a child, too, honestly. If we really want to get super deep into it, I think that hearing their counterpoint, you know, um, can, definitely Can I play you a thing me. I worked on yesterday? Please. Yes. Actually, I worked on it today, but I but I but I put these harmonies down more yesterday. I think if I do this, um, and I'm not sure that you'll that I, that I need to share a screen depending on how this voice meter is working. But let me know if you can hear this. Mm -mm. All those shifting lines weaving in and out it's, tight it's harmonies a, sus chords love that yeah oh thanks thanks yeah it's, it's that's the uh that's that's the it's sort of the beach boys beatles challenge you know, okay. can i can i do it can i reach in there and 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 make myself vulnerable and yeah i, got, I had to auto-tune a bit but um <laughs> and i think the ending yeah. is like sort of Maybe maybe too obviously from the the last side of Abbey Road from the last bit. There's a little Pink Floyd in there too. Oh, there's a little Pink Floyd in there. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of Dark Side in there. A little. Look at that Floyd. It's very little in pink. <laughs> <laughs> well, just <laughs> you know what I mean, though. Yeah. No, you no, know, no. A little Pink little Floyd. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just, I mean, just the feel of it. Not necessarily any specific line per se, but just the. The, the the reverb the the oh yeah the, cor the, the choral yeah. in the back and the yeah, oh the yeah line. you know yeah. and the chords are kind of a, a see you on the dark side of the moon just see a little yeah. yeah 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 no that's that's really wonderful I think voice voice is like see there's there's we were talking about songs too yeah a, it's a, magic a song a song with lyrics. It's like a painting with eyes in it. A point, a paint, you got, you got yeah. two kinds of paintings. You got paintings <laughs> that don't have any eyes in them, and you got paintings that have eyes in them. Yeah. Painting has eyes in it is a different animal. <laughs> Very much, yeah. Especially the ones that follow you across the room. Yeah. That's a song, <laughs> that's a song for you. That's a song. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Um, well, I I made a lot of notes here, so let me see what I've got compared to the notes I made before I even started talking to you. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> I know. Um, oh, yeah. The other thing that becomes apparent if you visit the George Sanger YouTube page is that you obviously have m multiple interests, which then becomes apparent when you learn about this engineering thing that you did when you were younger, right? You started off in as engineering and physics. Is that right? Um, so math, like you're on there talking about complex math theorems and oh, yeah, I, I had this, <laughs> this math jag I went on for a while, uh, just a, yeah. uh, about 10 years ago, 
that yeah. I thought that it would be uh, interesting. I had the capacity for it. I'd say I, I, I was I had a very good math teacher in high school, okay. um, and uh, and I was because of that I was really good at math. Then. Nice. And, we were, yeah. and, uh, and, you know, you go through life and you go, well, did I lose my facility? Am I, you know, was that something mm-hmm. I missed? And sometimes you go back and you taste it a little bit. I, I think I've gotten less interested in going back that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but, for, but about 10 years ago, uh, I thought, well, I'm going to take, I read a great book called Fermat's Last Theorem, which was about this very elegant uh, little bit of math that, uh, that, it took them a long time to prove it was it was a, a theory that uh, that this ancient mathematician came up with, uh, or, or actually he he. Let me just cut to the chase. If you <laughs> if if you if you take a a x squared plus b x squared equals c squared, you can you can make that work for I think it's a you know if you do. Oh, now I've even forgotten the most basic. Three, four, and five, I think. Five squared is 25, and three squares is four squared. Yeah, that works. Mm-hmm. Uh, something like that. But but uh, there are lots of examples of that using whole numbers. Um, okay. But it was theorized that you couldn't do that for A cubed plus B cubed equals C cubed. Mm. Uh, and in some book, Fermat wrote in the margin, I've got the proof. I know that you. I can prove that it... That, that there are no solutions other than the squared. And I yeah. thought, you know, if I visualize that, then, may, then maybe I could learn a little bit of something about math. And, you know, I'm not going to solve the world's hardest math problem, which that turned out to be, because it did get solved, but it took like, the, the story about it is fantastic. Right. Um, but uh, so I thought I'd just tug at the, the, the end of the thread that I could get a grip on. And I had mm-hmm. some fun with it. And I and I, I came up with I came came up with my own way of generating Pythagorean triples that I'm kind of proud of. Oh, uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I stopped doing it. It it, it, uh, it exercised a part of my brain that I just really didn't it did, didn't need that much exercise. I found another part of my. Uh, I, I think I, I, there were other modes that I wanted my brain to be in that sure. I was happier with. Sure. Um, so, uh, but uh, hmm. boy, that was fun. Thanks for asking about that. I also, <laughs> for a minute, and, and my archive at, the, at UT, uh, it, there's the, the George Sanger papers are at the University of Texas in the Briscoe okay. Center for American History. And in the same kind of room, like the other half of the room that's the office for that, is their math archive. Oh, cool. And I thought, wouldn't it be badass if I could get in both? So for a minute there, I was going, oh, yeah, maybe I'll do that. But if you read some of the histories of people who tried to, to, to accomplish something in math, they're not always the prettiest histories. I mean, you think behind the music is grizzled. Is, is, you know, behind the math? Is this, behind the math is like, oh, it's harsh. Yeah. Uh, what, what are you writing music for these days? Uh, I have a... Uh, uh, I'm writing actually more game music than I have in decades. Nice. Uh, so, but but first, uh, uh, the what I just played you is uh, an art project that I do called Turtle Money Sandwich. Okay. Um, this is our second EP. It's gonna, you know, we're just kind of putting the wraps on it. But the first one's on my Bandcamp page. You guys can find it. The Fat Man and Team Fat. Um, and. Uh, but uh, in the game world, and I'm doing other other art art projects, fun projects. But uh, in the game world, I'm working on a thing called uh, With Me, which is basically uh, what's that called? It's, the, 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 it's like uh, Second Life, but on a phone. Essentially. Okay. Yeah. And this has been a really interesting project because it's the first time in all these years, and I'll say decades, um, that I've had a producer who has sat with me three times a week and said, I'd like you to make it a little more like this. Give me five ideas. I like that one. I don't like that one. Let's make it a little bit more like this. Let's mine this field for this. These are the parameters. I never had that you know when it was with seventh guest i was you know i was lobbing stuff over the fence and and hoping they'd like it and didn't hear from them but it turned out it was good <laughs> um 
so so that's been fun. And the guy that I'm working with, Bob Welch, he's the Bop It guy. No. Ja. Oh my God. <laughs> he's the Bop It guy. Wow, that's like a whole era of my life. <laughs> Don't you love it? (laughs) He's great to work with, and it's a different experience. And it's 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 uh, it's got a camaraderie to it. It's uh, I would say it's humbling, except it doesn't feel humbling at all. It feels like you. I feel like I'm providing a service for somebody who knows what they want. Yeah. Oh, did you find the ukulele videos? No. What? No. Where are those? No. Okay. Patrick Greeson. Okay. G R E E S O N. And I, I've got a playlist somewhere on my on my page, but I may not have made it public. Um, okay. It is, uh, the Stray Cat Pat and the Back Alley Boys. And uh, he his goal he's 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 a he's a ukulele player. He's okay. not the world's best. The guy who teaches him is among the world's best. Okay. Uh, he's he's not particularly a grand singer, but his he wants to have fun, and mm-hmm. he wants to play things on ukulele that you wouldn't think are ukulele songs. And so we have we are on our twelfth video. What we do is he comes oh, over. Cool. He comes over with a cajon player and me, and we <laughs> we play a tune. And then I fix, I blow it into Photoshop, you know, and put all the parts where they need to go. Yeah. But but after, you know, we 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 do the lay down the tune in an hour in my in my studio in the garage, mm-hmm. which is called the woodshed because it's where Dad and I used to work on things like that, those oh. bases over there. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, then we go out into the onto the back porch, and we shoot video shoot a video. The whole thing yeah. takes you know three hours for the whole deal, and and my my stepson edits the video together oh, and cool. he posts it and it's it's just too oh, fun that's, that's so that's anyway that's so i'm doing those uh mm-hmm. but and i'm doing with me uh i'm doing a thing called uh a first i want to say for some jokers in germany but when i say <laughs> jokers i mean comedians okay <laughs> <laughs> really they're really good comedians, and when I say really good comedians, I haven't heard their jokes, but they're really good at producing, and it's in a totally different style from Bob. Uh, okay. It's you know, and this is this game is called uh, the company is Comico, and the game is Screenplay, and it's a it's a you know video game. It's card based video game, okay, and it's it's the a comedy uh, where you you take on the persona of this weird uh, exaggerated movie director and you and and there's all these genres and and you represent a genre so your action films or or adventure or comedy mm-hmm. or whatever yeah and uh, uh, so I, I wrote a surf rock intro for it that's what they wanted they wanted orchestral surf rock and that can be found on steam uh, <laughs> that's come out that the rest of the game hasn't come out and then okay. the rest of it is parody movie music. Now, if you wind the clock back to Wing Commander, yeah, that was the first time anybody impersonated John Williams in a game. Oh, because wow. it did just the technology didn't exist before that. Right, right. And and we happened to have, uh, you know, Dave Govett, who was a great worshipper of John Williams. So you know, mm-hmm. and and the client asked for that. So boom, boom, boom. A, a tiny perfect storm. Not the Beatles, but. You know, it was a moment. <laughs> yeah. So now wind the clock forward a little bit, and it's like, and I'm going, man, why is everybody just doing movie impersonation music? This is really, you know, let's let's have our own life. Let's be our own thing. Let's do this out, you know. Let's do weird music. Let's do our own thing. Come on, let's be creative. Yeah. Just because something is cinematic, just because, okay, movie-like, movie, this game has a movie-like score. You know, no movie ever came out and said, "Yeah, we have a movie-like score." <laughs> yeah. an absurd so, so I, I, that was one of the torches I used to carry. I used to hate that. Now I finally come for a cir- full circle, and I'm doing the orchestral movie-like stuff, but it's parody, <laughs> and I'm loving it. So this yeah. is like, uh, I've done three themes so far, um, five minutes long, and they've got three layers. Each, you know, low, okay. low intensity, yeah. mid intensity, high intensity, and they mm-hmm. and they cross fade during during gameplay, and then they can always cut to another genre. So I've done action, I've done adventure, and I've done horror. 
Okay. <laughs> I got I got too busy with with me, so I brought in Steve Kirk, who is a fabulous composer, and and he did uh, Voodoo Vince, Thimbleweed Park, uh, okay. Farmville, and he's okay. he's great. He's legit. He plays in a in a band with Ron Jones, who's the the orchestrator for Family Guy and and Star Trek and and, okay. and those things, and uh, and he holds his own. And he and he's a songwriter buddy of mine. You can get this, the Steve Kirk George Singer collaboration also on Bandcamp. Oh, nice. um, it's called "Look Who's Driving," um, and uh, and so now he's doing the next batch. Um, and he did the surf themed menu music. But you know, interesting yeah. thing when I was I was working with a, a cat in Corsica on a weird oh. art project. You don't even want to know. Don't I? <laughs> The story of Flocka Seagal. Look it up on YouTube and prepare never to emerge again. Okay. <laughs> and, he, and, and this Ran guy, uh, and, and of all things, he goes, there is a composer who you need to be friends with. You know, this guy, Steve Kirk, are you guys like brothers or something? And he didn't know we'd been working on this album together. <laughs> but just based on Steve's sound. Wow. So Steve's, so Steve's great. Okay. So anyway, uh, let's see, working on that. And there's some other things that I haven't thought of. You know, there's actually this company that is called uh, uh, Mega Cat. <laughs> and uh, they make these. <gasps> what? And, and no. I think that, and, and we're working on a, on a deal, it, it just it, we've got the contract. It's just like this far for me and Joe to get the band back together, get the old team fat back together, wow. and do some of that retro, do some of those beeps and boops from before. <laughs> you know, you we've come a long way from the beeps and boops. Can we go back? I know. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like I should play a little bit of the Comico, but I'm going to leave it because I think the contract uh, asked me to be a little bit. They okay. asked me to be secret, but they've they've already the the theme tune is is yeah. up on on Steam, and you can find that. Okay. I will. Yeah. So what else? So thank you for asking me for what what I'm working on. I'm actually looking well, at my yeah. list of things to do. And, yeah. Uh, I think you, we've we've covered the main thing. I should should plug. Yeah. Did I say Brian Watkins? Yeah. Turtle Money Sandwich. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> You're very good at naming things. You have funny, consistently names that make you smile. Well, you thank know? you. Good. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Brian, Brian and I worked for about 15 years together at a slot machine company. Oh, you know, I, I, was, I was out of house, and he was the okay. mathematician. <laughs> and they didn't have a design department. And I ran a think tank for game design. And I was always pushing mm -hmm. for game design. So I, I, I would, and, you know, I talked to Brian about my far out game designs for slot machines. And I said, you got to have the weird stuff, man. You got to have like a, a, a game that's broken, you know, so that people <laughs> feel like, you know, I can beat this machine. It seems like it's broken, you know. <laughs> and and he, yes. he's like, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, he took that and went his own way with it, and he and his little think tank came up with Turtle Money Sandwich. It was supposed to be a it was supposed to be a slot machine, <laughs> and uh, that game company went from like a little strip mall, you know, the, you know those those uh, the strip mall. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not strip mall. Those, those where you've got a bunch of industrial buildings in a strip. Oh it yeah, went from one yeah. of those to being a billion dollar company, an actual literally billion dollar company. Wow, um, and. Uh, you know, so that was a, that was a beautiful thing, and we got to do that together, me and Brian. And, and when that went away, you know, we kind of were looking at each other, and and he had me do some music for you know for uh, he had me like splice a bunch of Grateful Dead tunes together for him, and then we're like talking, and he's like, I've got these songs. Yeah, I know your songs. He wrote a love song for a freeway interchange. I thought it was the <laughs> sweetest damn thing. Oh, and uh, he said, Well, maybe you could work on one of my songs. So we, that's been a that's been a love mm -hmm. project. It's been so it's so nice to get to spend time writing lyrics. Whatever the topic is, you can turn it to something higher. And 
yeah. you know, and 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 I'm not saying Brian's lyrics are always just high enough, and so just getting to wallow in those lyrics and and mm-hmm. just put put notes around them and frame them up and have as much time as I need to build the to build a frame for the for his painting. He sends me lyrics and a guitar thing, and I do everything else, mm-hmm. and and he sings it. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's like that. And I want to get one more one more story for for Adam Gubman, is that yeah. there. I, I did uh, the the most recent one I did for him. It's for a character n- named Heliger, who's in a mm-hmm. world called I can't remember what it's called, but if you look up Heliger, you'll find it. And mm-hmm. uh, it's a very popular game series, uh, also card based. Uh, and these these characters, when you're playing the game, they're just little cards. You know, they're little chess pieces. They're little chibis. You know, and they fight and, and they do their thing. Mm-hmm. But they've got all this backstory, and the company is smart enough that they uh, that they are doing music videos. And the music video consists of an animated you know GIF of like the person standing there with his book and his pipe, or his scarf, his dog, and the wind is blowing, you know, or something like that. And then you hear the song with the lyrics up there. Well, this mm-hmm. race. This, this this character that I did is a, is the oldest fighter. He's tired of fighting, but he's really good at it. And uh, and his race is sort of based on Russian. <laughs> and and so I got to write the lyrics, just the lyrics for this character, and about how he's he's tired of war. And I got to write. A, a, an anti-war theme that's mm-hmm. for a fighter, but I, I got to put that twist on it. You know, it's like, yeah. well, sometimes you do what you got to do. And I scoured the internet for for Russian s- slogans about war and the pain of it. And there's a lot of, you know, they they know hurt. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, we all do. And they've got, they've got great Russian ways of saying it. <laughs> um, Indeed. And this was before the invasion. Yeah. And so this got the timing of it was beautiful. There's a, the, mm-hmm. and but the fun thing is, what is it when you write lyrics and they're going to be translated into Russian? What are you doing? Are you writing lyrics, or are you right. just? So, but I wrote the lyrics. They got translated into Russian, and then at the video, and and and, and he, Adam wrote the music and had beautiful singing on it, beautiful playing, just mm. top notch stuff. And then it has a translation from the Russian of what the lyrics mean. Oh, okay. So, so it's like it's like drawing your best drawing and then putting it on a Xerox machine and then Xeroxing that and doing that. You know, it's like a yeah, total yeah, yeah. distorto. Well, you know, it's like audio. It's like it's like lo-fi. Yeah. So, so how it, different it really, was it? How different it was? Uh, I think it missed one tiny point. Okay. And then the rest of it really had that nice blurring effect, okay. where it's like it's a little more open than mm-hmm. what I wrote. It's a little less specific, mm-hmm. and so you can go, you know, what did this old man mean when he <laughs> said that? Yeah. Ah, yeah, you know, you got to kind of nod your head. Yeah. So, so I was real pleased with that. Hey, was guitar your first instrument? What was your first instrument? <laughs> you and me, baby. Really. You and me. Yeah, trumpet. No kidding. You didn't play anything before you played trumpet. That's right. Wow. And the Mr. Demon, Bob Demon, drafted me from middle school because they had a small band. They had a 36-piece band. And they were marching in competitions against 200-piece bands. Oh, geez, yeah. They were getting ready to do that. And they they Mm -hmm. needed more people, so they drafted me out of the middle school. So I had six (laughs) years of, of band with this charismatic surf guitar player who used to open for the the Beach Boys would open for them. Oh, wow. dude, today I just looked at their Wikipedia page. This is the astronauts? Is that the what they're astronauts. called? Uh-huh. Yeah, the astronauts. Yeah, the astronauts. I just was looking at their Wikipedia page because I was watching, the, uh, I was watching a, a, a movie about the, uh, the wrecking crew. Okay. And, and who I also really admire. And, and uh, I noticed that at the bottom it says, you know, Bob Demon went on to teach high school at Coronado. George Sanger was one of his students. (laughs) That's cool. (laughs) That's today. That's cool. That's very cool. That's the second person to know that. 
Yeah. That for me. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, trumpet. Yeah. Okay. Um, wow. and, then, and, and then I got braces, so I had to move to baritone. That's an old story. Okay. And then, yeah. But Bob uh, let me play. Uh, he taught me guitar on the guitars that he used in the astronauts. And these are these, these are these blonde contour, you know, these yeah. guys. Yeah, right? show me that telly. And, and they, oh, well, that was, oh, that that's was not telly, yeah. You know, they, they had certain jazz masters and, and uh, uh, jaguars and uh, wow. jazz basses all matching with the matching amps. They were sponsored by Fender. And I and and if you look at their album, look at their album covers. You'll see, you know, any kid would be like. And 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 I learned, you know, the, these cool guys have been on Shindig and Hullabaloo, and I'd hung out with Glenn Campbell and and wow. you know, and kicked out of the studio by you know, hey, the, the, the Rolling Stones, you know, hey, we're recording in Studio B. You guys are in Studio A. Can we hang out a little bit? And Mick turns around and goes, "Who are you?" You know. <laughs> I, He's been kicked out by some classy cats, you know, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, yeah. So that that so yeah. I picked up guitar and bass from 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 him directly, and uh, wow, uh, that was uh, that was great. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the reasons that Team Fat used to do surf instrumental sets. Uh, yeah, yeah, big yeah, influence cause... there, the surf. Yeah, yeah, surf rock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Yep. So, and every once in a while, I'll get out the old trumpet and put on a couple of lines because, you know, if you learn it, if there's nothing else you learn from the 60s, it's that a little bit of bad trumpet is a lot better than no trumpet. <laughs> Please, I'm, in, I'm literally getting that tattooed tomorrow. <laughs> it's the best thing ever. <laughs> it's all yours. And you might want a fat seal on there, too. Yeah, I should. <laughs> <laughs> get your signature underneath it or something oh my god that's yeah. amazing yeah i don't i don't it's been almost a year since i played my trumpet which is crazy um, now are you a person who has to like really like build it up like a like an athlete because yeah I, I can't pick it up and play for more than probably 10 minutes without needing a break bob could pick that dog up he'd like he'd walk over to you and he'd say hey you know let me see that thing if you're playing a little weak he'd pick it yeah. up and go you know, no warm up. You take it up an octave. They go, nothing wrong with the horn. Oh man! He I'd looked like him. he looked like James Dean. He wore these cowboy oh. cowboy shirts with like way too many buttons that his yeah. go go dancer looking wife made for him. <laughs> I mean, that guy, that Amazing. guy, all charisma. Yeah, and but but man, could he play the trumpet? Wow! Yeah, they did a version of they did a version of uh, Miserloo where the bridge was was him on trumpet, and it sounded like oh. like yeah, Herb Alpert, you think you can play? Listen to this! <laughs> Great stuff. I got to interview Herb Alpert not that Good. long ago, actually. Um, How's he doing? couple years ago i mean he was great i'm sure he wouldn't remember me because we weren't even on video but um but yeah because he oh. released an album with one of his kids like four years ago maybe cool was yeah, he playing trumpet was, yeah yes yes he was yes sounded better than i do playing trumpet right now yeah. he's like 90 i think or something maybe more than that now it's crazy anyway I saw that, yeah. that story yesterday um, yesterday I was catching up on uh, on the Wrecking Crew movie. When when he did Tijuana Brass, he couldn't afford. He paid everybody like fifteen bucks, you know. And uh, and then when the record came out and did and did well, mm -hmm. he talked to the record company. He talked to the union. He paid his fine, and he got them all scale. Wow. He went back and did the right thing. Yeah. So, Good for him. Yeah. I mean, savvy business, dude. That's for sure. That's, yeah. I mean, yeah. Good for him. What else do you, you, do you just play trumpet? Um, yeah. I mean, I started on piano, but I was always pretty terrible at it because I liked trumpet so much more. So I didn't cool. ever really develop my bass clef chops, you know? I was always way faster at reading treble. I still am, obviously, faster yeah. at reading treble clef than bass clef. And I took piano for many, many, many years. 
Um, and then just I have got other things laying around like a clarinet and a banjo and a guitar and um, just well, some other stuff that I mess around with a little bit. Yeah. But nothing no one pays me for. So it's, it's nothing like that anymore. <laughs> used to be that it. way, but not anymore. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, but, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I should probably it's been this is we've talked for ages and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it's been great. I feel like I could I could keep going, but I know it's getting late. We'll do and, we'll do another one sometime. And I if hope you, so. If you're feeling it, yeah. I I would love that. I'm still around. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be That'd great. Be great. This this has been yeah. a good one. Yeah, thank That's you. That's been super fun, George. I've really appreciated to finally get a chance to talk to you, and it's been it's been a blast. I knew it would be so. <laughs> you know, I've I've zoomed in and looked at a, a few of your videos. I saw you, you know, working with Matts, and uh, oh, you know, yeah. wow, you're just, you're just so uh, knowledgeable about these things. You do such a good oh, job. Thank you. I you appreciate know, it, that. It's uh, it, it's it's really quite a collection you put together too, mm. and and all the I mean, who haven't you talked to? Uh, I mean, pretty much anyone on the other side of the world you know certainly no one japanese ever no no one from that world but pretty much everybody else i've tried you know oh, yeah. and there's some people i still can't even get to answer back but that's just some people just don't want to do interviews so it's fine yeah okay. <laughs> yeah i don't know it's been fun that's been a really fun thing and i just um i mean i've been interviewing people for radio for ages and I, I enjoy doing it it's fun to give someone a question and pull the string and let them go i like it you did great <laughs> you did great thank you i appreciate it <laughs>